Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. We'll be getting started in just a moment. Everyone, we're going to be getting started in just a moment, uh, about one minute or so. But while we're waiting, tell us where you're from, who you are, um, give your your school a shout out. You know, drop in some info of of where you work and and tell us why you're here today. All right. Okay, we will go ahead and get started. And um, I will do that. So before we um, get started with the actual webinar, I just want to go over a few housekeeping notes. Um, please uh, note that we are going to share the recording of this webinar after. Uh, pr we'll probably do that later on today or tomorrow. There is a Q&A box if you want to ask any specific questions, you can drop them in there, but you're also welcome to drop questions in the chat box as well. Uh, the chat can be used to share resources or just have general conversation and general chatter, um, and we will read that as we're going through throughout the presentation. Um, we're also going to have a few moments at the very end for Q&A, so if you want to wait for that, you can um, also save your questions for that section as well. Um, and yeah, we encourage engagement. I know this isn't the best format for engagement, but um, we definitely want you to, um, you know, drop any questions or anything that you have in the chat and we'll definitely be responsive uh, with that as well. So with that, I will go ahead and kick this off and send send it over to um, John Galepsi, who is our VA specialist here at Laredal. And uh, John, go ahead and kick it off. Thank you, Helen. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good morning for some of you. Uh, John Gillespie here. I'm the National Accounts Manager for the VA, so I kind of manage our relationship with the VA healthcare system. Um, we've been very, very fortunate in having uh, the support of Dr. Watts. Uh, she has been a tremendous resource and uh and supporting the webinars that we're doing for the VA. Uh, these are specific to the VA. We do welcome others, of course, but uh, this is a resource that, that we determined to be something that would be of uh, exceptional value uh, to, to our partners in the VA. Um, this is not a selling opportunity. This is literally dedicated to helping you all be more successful with the, the products that you already own. I, Today's topic is uh, pre-briefing, right? So, so pre-briefing is an area that a lot of us are challenged with. I know as a simulationist, I when I was a customer, I always was challenged with this. So I'm particularly excited about having the opportunity to go over pre-briefing uh, with Dr. Watts. Uh, Helen, let's move to the next slide. So our, as I mentioned, our guest speaker today is Dr. Penny Watts. Uh, Penny is from University of Alabama, Birmingham. Uh, she has been a longtime colleague and friend, uh, count her in my friend list. Um, Dr. Watts uh, was chair of the committee for the uh, standards of best practice during their latest revision, and, uh, and we're honored to have her present with us today. Uh, Dr. Watts, thank you for joining us. Thank you. I can always talk about the standards. So, <laughs> thank you. So we were curious, and uh, we were going to do this as a poll. Uh, what do you hope to gain out of the webinar today? Um, 
But we also thought that it might be beneficial just to have everybody either drop it in the chat or in the question and answer box and, uh, and make this a bit more engaging than just a poll. So what is it that you all would like to get today out of this? You know, personally, for me, one of the challenges is uh, insights you. How do you how do you drop a mannequin on the floor in the hallway outside the emergency room, and uh, and still be able to pre-brief uh, the participants that are going to be part of that? Um, I'm looking forward to to that discussion. Does anybody else have any? Quiet group today, Penny. see some good things in there. Oh, good. Awesome. Good. So, Dr. Watts, why don't you feel free to uh, take it from there? Okay. Well, guys, I'm very excited to be here today. And I, I love seeing the comments um, on there because I know your situation being in the hospital, your time restricted, your, um, especially with in situ, can be difficult. And if a person hasn't done a simulation in a year, you feel like you're, you know, going back over that. So um, hopefully we'll tap into that. And I really want you guys to ask questions as we move along. So please, I guess, pop up their hand, raise your hand on there, and either Helen or John will catch that. You can interrupt me. I want this to be a conversation as we um, move along. So um, as we are looking at the standards, um, here, here's where we are with the current standards and the ones that we have already completed, and we're on pre-briefing. So today we'll be a quick overview, I could talk all day about pre-briefing um, if I had a day, uh, but hopefully we'll give you some golden nuggets out of um, this as we move forward. And I think later we'll figure out what other standards do you want to hear in the future as we move forward, which next one. So, um, next slide. So as you know, when we think of the core four standards um, for endorsement with the NAXL, I think of in my mind, which ones should we focus on? Definitely, these are my four debriefing, facilitation, professional integrity, and pre briefing. And I think pre briefing um, is just as important as debriefing because the sim may not matter as much if you have a good pre briefing. Things happen in, in the simulation, right? But if you can set your learners up for success at the beginning, you're going to have a better sim and a better debriefing at the end. But how you do that is going to depend upon quite a few things, which we'll talk about. Um, next slide, please. So the standards of best practice we haven't covered so far, as you can see here, outcomes and objectives, professional development, evaluation, SIM design, IPE. Um, I think we have done operations previously on here, and I think we haven't covered those, and we will get to those. These are all intermingled. They're all interwoven. They're separate documents, but um, they are interconnected, and we'll kind of hopefully connect those to some of the other standards. So. All right, next slide. So when we think of pre-briefing, um, this is a standard, this is an infograph, a very a brief summary of the standard. And I'm going to go through each of these criteria as we move forward. But if you look on here, there are nine criteria. Don't let it scare you. There's a full PDF, I think, that will be shared with you at the end um, that talks about these specific criteria. So generally, there's three universal criteria that apply across everything. But if you notice the title of this standard is pre-briefing, preparation, and briefing. So in this iteration of the standard, those two areas were broken out because they can be two specifically or two specific things that happened beforehand, but they're separate. It can be separate, doesn't necessarily mean that. So we have universal, then we have the preparation criteria, and then we have the, the briefing criteria um, that we cover. So I want to go through a little bit, then I'm going to ask you guys a question. So let's move on to criterion one, Helen, if you can. So the criterion one is the simulation should be knowledgeable about the scenario. And I firmly believe as you are developing your sim, you are working on the pre-briefing. And I've learned that once you go through the sim one time in the pre-briefing, as you get to the end, you're like, 
saying, I should have told this in the pre-briefing. I should have mentioned this. Um, and I think every time you do your sum and repeat it, you get better with your pre-briefing area. Let me give you an example. Um, knowing about the scenario and feeling comfort in these concepts related to pre-briefing. So me knowing the scenario was important. One time we kept going through a simulation, students could not work a defibrillator. It just, they just struggled. So we spent so much time going back over that at the very end. So what did we do in the preparation and briefing phase? I forget which one we did it in. We went over the defibrillator one more time to make sure they knew. But we did that because we did that just in time. Hey, how do we make this better next time we run this sim and do this pre-brief? So I'm constantly tweaking that pre-brief until now we have certain pre-briefs for different events. And I think you will get to that as you move along. But I do think you need to be familiar with the scenario. And as you develop the scenario, you're thinking of what needs to be in the briefing or the preparation phases. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so with the pre-briefing in this criteria, and of course, there's several um, elements. And I have the standard with me that I'm going through. And I think Helen's going to give you a QR code later that you can um, use as you're going through that. I want to make sure I have this available. But pre-briefing should be developed according to the purpose and learning objectives of the simulation-based experience. And you guys have hospital-based learners most of the time, right? So you have to consider what are your objectives for those staff members um, or whoever is participating, whether it's a team-based experience, whether it's mock codes, or whether it's something outside, as John said, outside the emergency room. Um, those are pretty um, important things to consider, as well as the level of the learner. Um, you know, if it's a brand new nurse, maybe it's a nurse residency program versus the OR team who has worked quite a bit together. Um, that's something you're going to need to consider as you develop your pre-briefing. Um, getting ready for the, the, the simulation, looking at the objective. So what do they need to know before they come in? Will they have the knowledge and experience, or at least knowledge, to go through the simulation and really be able to get something out of it. What are our objectives? What's the level of your learner as well? Let's say it's high stakes, okay? What if it's something that they can't, if they have to run the simulation and be competent as they go through, if it's high stakes for some reason, what is your pre-brief for that event? I don't know how many high stakes actually happen in the hospital setting, I'm not sure. So I don't run high stakes um, in our area right now. We don't grade those, they're more formative learning. But what materials are you going to provide <clears throat> and how are you going to prepare them? So next slide, please. As I kind of mentioned before, looking at the level of learner really plays a huge piece of this. And I think as, as in a hospital setting, if it is mock codes and MICU or the emergency room, most of the staff, maybe they've been there for quite a while, you know, how much do you need to give them beforehand? So usually there's kind of this inverse proportional ratio to the simulation learner. My new nursing students, we have to walk them in and hold their hand and show them the equipment, talk them through it like a clinical instructor. <clears throat> but as the learners get more experience throughout our undergraduate program, we're going to do a little bit less. Um, we're still going to brief them appropriately and maybe give them some materials, but maybe they don't have as much prep work. because They've already kind of been prepared all along this semester. Okay. Same thing with your staff. You know, maybe it's a new rollout of a new team model that you're using. And they've practiced it some. Maybe they need some information. But at this point, they've all worked in a team before. How much do you need to give them within the pre-briefing experience? Okay, next slide, please. So as we're moving into separating preparation and briefing, I wanted to ask a question and see if you guys would just pop some things into the chat box. <clears throat> Or you can hop off and talk to me. I'm good with that, Helen. I think they can do that. So um, how do you currently pre-brief? How do you prep your learners, your staff, whomever is coming in? What are some of your mechanisms for pre-briefing that you currently use? Okay. Oh, thank you, Deborah, for chiming in. You know, I'm good with silence. I'm a debriefer, so I'm cool with it. Pre-assigned work prior to attending the simulation. So for preparation, they've got something, a quiz or maybe reading a policy, 
or we're doing a protocol or something that's been assigned to them prior to attending the sim. Is that correct, Deborah? Is what I'm seeing. Yes, they have to be prepared and know before they come in. Now, they may not know the scenario you're going to use, or you might tell them what the scenario is. Depends upon your objective and the level of your learner. So, thank you. Who else? How else do you pre-brief learners? While we're waiting for someone to answer, anyone do in situ simulation? And how do you pre-brief them? Thank you, Deborah. Anyone do in situ simulation and you have to brief them? Okay. The educator on the units help prior to our arrival. That's excellent. So sometimes before they get to the floor, the educators might be there to prep them. Um, some way that we have done at our institution is They've been sent an email. Everyone knows that SIM is coming. You will have a mock code. It's written in the email. Um, the managers have talked to them. That's right, thank you. Um, the Insight2, the manager preps them. And the thing to consider with Insight2 is just because the manager preps them and says, hey, there's gonna be a simulation, it's gonna be in the next month, this is going to occur, um, you know, be sure you're all in, that you own that fiction contract, that we're going to have the basic assumption about everyone, et cetera. Um, that really helps. So thank you, Shelly. For my codes, it's hard to do a pre-brief other than giving them the scenario for me. That's excellent. So it is hard if you just throw a mannequin in a room, you do a mock code. So this is where sometimes it's announced from the manager on that unit or the emails are sent or however. The, it takes a long time to make it culture, but you will have a simulation on your unit this month. It will be a mock code. You need to remember these 10 things. And often what happens was when you push the call button and all the nurses come running for a mock code, sometimes they pause and say, this is a simulation. Please remember these three things kind of as a quick pre-brief and then they do their scenario. Um, it's very hard with those. So I do like the ingenuity there um, for you guys trying to um, do that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more, but thank you all for sharing. So we're going to talk about the preparation criteria, and I think that Deborah talked about this. That participants should receive a pre-briefing that includes instructions on the goals, expectations, and procedures of the simulation. And I do have like one of our pre-briefing checklists. I have a couple of examples. You can Google these. Um, I even have an article that kind of outlines things because I have kind of a set, uh, a list of things that I want to include as even in the standards. Um, but beforehand, I'm, or if I'm getting them ready, they may have some materials they need to review, they need to know about expectations, where to show up, what you're supposed to do. We also want to talk about the psychological safety, that this is a learning opportunity and not necessarily a place to be judged or assessed. And I know in a hospital situation, I've heard this before, sometimes it might be the manager watching the, the staff member or watching the learner in the hospital. It may be their supervisor in there. And if that is the case, the learner needs to be aware of it. And is that truly a psychologically safe place? So I'm gonna throw that out there as kind of just something for you to consider. Depends upon how it's handled. If it's all about supporting our learners, helping those staff do better, that is fine. But we have to consider, is it assessment? Is it a place for judgment? And um, we always are gonna have judgment, but of course I believe in the debriefing with good judgment model. Um, but we have to consider, is this gonna, if we're telling them we want you to feel safer. You can make mistakes. We're going to talk about it. It's a new protocol. We're going to help you get strategies to do it. Then that's what needs to be prepared beforehand. And you need to actually implement that throughout the rest of your simulation and your um, debriefing. So really making sure they know, is this graded for academics or is this going, how is this going to affect them? That's, next slide, please. Oh, I did want to pause. So Michelle, thank you for her mock codes. There's not a pre-brief, so it is a surprise, which I love. But for mock code trainings in the training room, they pre-brief the room in the situation. So thank you, Michelle, for sharing. So hopefully at some point, it took a long time at UAB, it's now the culture, that there had to be some communication to everyone that there was going to be something coming out. And usually it's sent by to the units or to other areas saying, hey, we're going to be doing mock code simulations over the next three months. 
This will be on your unit. We don't know when. It will be a surprise. Um, but these are the things you need to remember. This will happen, fiction contract, basic assumption, all those things, this is a learning experience, et cetera. You will act as, as you're in your uh, regular um, role, et cetera. So all those things sometimes are emailed out beforehand or covered in some other way, especially if it's coming over the next um, way. Oh, yes, um, and concur with Michelle from Octos who wants to test the current system. Yes, I agree with the system testing. Um, it's a really, really good thing um, to do. Okay, let's go back to the preparation criteria. Thank you guys for sharing. Um, preparation materials in Criterion 5 should align with its purpose and learning objectives. And there may be various activities to help them learn. So I'm thinking of in the hospital setting, if you're preparing a mock code simulation, maybe an OR simulation with, you know, maybe it's anesthesia doing um, malignant hypothermia, right? Do they have enough information and activities to prepare them for that situation? Um, or are you telling them, hey, there's going to be in situ sim, you don't know the topic because they've been practicing CRNAs. And maybe it's one of those high risk, low frequency, which is malignant hypothermia, maybe fire in the OR, um, things that you need to consider. But how will you prepare them? And it just depends on you. You as a simulationist can decide how much. You run it once, you say, hey, They've had some weaknesses. We need to cover this. So a lot of times you're going back and tweaking this as we um, moving on. So, um, okay. So let's move to the next criteria for preparation. Preparation six. Preparation, prepar excuse me, preparation materials should be provided both beforehand and on the day of the event. And I firmly believe that some of our simulations, there, there is no materials given out beforehand. They've been covering shift assessment or, you know, a mock codes or whatever throughout their skills lab and their practice labs and their classroom. So they may not get any more materials before they come, but they are getting information like you will have the simulation on this day. You will have a variety of patients that might deteriorate and might need resuscitation because we learned they all came in. This is what they would do in mock codes. We told them they went straight to the patient and said, they didn't even talk to them. They just went straight to check a pulse on their carotid. So it was like they knew it was coming. So we kind of changed it up a little bit and talked about deteriorating patients. And maybe they um, ended up needing resuscitation, maybe one or two, just not depending upon their day. But including those key elements prior to them coming to set them up for success. And it may be that learners need a refresher on the defibrillator or the AED, or maybe it's a new piece of equipment that's being integrated into your environment, some system testing. Have they received training on the new IV pump? or the new infuser, you know, the rapid infuser, you know, are you including those things and preparing them for going? Um, a lot of learners want to repeat the simulation, which is very interesting. Um, I cannot imagine um, being in sim myself back in the day, because we didn't have sim. I think I saw some things about in the 80s. Um, we tried to fail a lot of people in ACLS. Oh, my goodness. I remember it was a tough, tough kind of thing. So I think we're in a much better place. But we're setting them up for success. But they're still having to go in there and manage the environment and implement these things. And I believe as learners become more, um, especially academic, as they progress in their programs, they need more complex, a little bit more cognitive load to simulate the real environment because things don't happen in the clinical setting. Family is always going to be around, right, or to some degree. There's always going to be discussions on end of life that may get heated between the long lost brother and the daughter. Um, so we do try to make them more complex. And as you work with your staff, as you have this curriculum of all of your events, you're evaluating, are all my nurses right now brand new six months out of graduation? Or have most of my people been there a while? Do we have some new people? So you guys are the ones out there kind of judging what information do they need. Some may not need any. Some might do the checks and say I've done it, and some might. What's curious to me is we've done some mock codes in the OR with nurse anesthesia. And it's amazing that many of them cannot run a code as the leader because they've been in that role as a CRNA pretty much with the team, right? And it's handled very differently. So depends upon, like I said, your goals and providing them the information that they may, might need to be successful. So next criterion, Helen, please. So criteria seven is prior to the simulation experience, 
We want to convey important information to expectations, the agenda, and the logistics. So usually if I've done a preparation video, so sometimes our grad students come in, we send a video out. Perhaps you can do that in your hospital. You send out a video via email or in your learning management system, whatever you might be using, kind of preparing them for what it's going to be like. Now, there's always the question with, do you give the scenario or not? Are you really planning to trick them? We're not trying to trick anyone. First semester student, I might say, you are going to be assessing a cardiac patient because they're new, they can barely, you know, open up their pen light and work their stethoscope. But a fifth semester senior, I might say the objective is, is you're gonna manage care of a critically ill patient, depending upon their level. And in the hospital setting, it's going to be the same way. As they come into your simulation, you might tell them a little bit about the case or what the objectives are. You're going to mention such things as, and these are in the standard and I have another article to send. We talk about the basic assumption. Has anyone heard the basic assumption? We include it, we have it posted on the wall. Basically this is everyone here at UAB or in your VA, they are capable, they are wanting to do their best and they're out here to take, to improve their care of patients overall. And that's our basic assumption. We also ask people in our briefing to adhere to the fiction contract. You know, we're not 100% perfect on realism. We want you to buy in. We want you to act as if this is real because you do get more out of it. You know, we have students that laugh or may blow it off, and we have staff that have done that too. And so we usually try to shut that down pretty quickly. Most of the time, people really get into it. So I talk about the basic assumptions. We talk about the fiction contract. We also include in our pre-briefing confidentiality. You know, confidentiality of the case so that everyone gets the same experience. We also mention confidentiality of performance. And I always say we're not going to post on Facebook that John Gillespie is terrible at chest compression because that's important, that the learners are protected and that we're here to help each other. And it's about the patient and everyone getting better. We do talk about logistics, where the bathroom is, if they need to know that you're going to participate in a SIM. Um, and actually, I sometimes don't even call it a SIM. I actually say you're going to be caring for Mr. Jones today, or you're going to be working on MICU. You're going to be the relief nurse coming in to support whatever. Try not to use that backstage language, um, especially when I get to debriefing. I try to avoid, I don't say, hey, in the sim, I often say, when you were caring for Mr. Gillespie, you know, I noticed this. Talk me through what happened for you. So we try to set them up with the expectations, even regarding supplies or mannequins. Maybe it's a new sim area today, right? Um, it depends on kind of where you are, but you're always wanting to provide them with enough information on expectations and so forth. Okay, Helen, next slide, please. So this is another one that I don't know your situation. I would love to hear from anyone that's willing to, to pop into the chat um, or raise your hand is what is your orientation to the environment, including the modality? Um, for example, what we do in our unit, first semester students come to a day of orientation in the lab. They have a scavenger hunt. They get to play with the mannequins and the supply cart. Um, so we kind of have a structured orientation. Our graduate students come to campus once a semester for three or four days. They may never have been in a STEM lab. So we have to look at different ways to get them oriented to the environment. So we try to let them walk through on that day. Now, we also do videos. We will send them a video as an assignment that maybe shows the environment, what their goal is going to be, and kind of do a pre-briefing before they come. And mind you, when they come, we remind them, hey, you're going to be videotaped. Please keep things confidential. Remember, you're in the ER, and um, you know there are protocols you might use, whatever it we're doing for our simulation event. But I think having some type of orientation is very important. So if you're at the VA and you have one sim center, many places may have multiple rooms or areas you use for simulation across the, the hospital. Do, tell me how many of you may have different environments you use and different people or people in the hospital go to different environments to do sim. Can anyone pipe in the chat box? Let's see if I can read on down. So you do majority in situ, so the staff is in their environment, which I love in situ simulation. I think it's great. I think it can be hard for you guys. Um, but thank you for sharing, because I do think that they do know their supplies and what they can use. Um, so Deborah says they orient to the equipment when they get in the room. 
and then some do generally do everything in their STEM lab. Great. So it depends on your environment. Um, oh, someone says they mix it up, but most are in the STEM center. Excellent. So it depends on your environment. It depends upon where you are and how you're going to orient um, people to the environment. Because many students or learners or staff in the debrief always say, well, I couldn't find my supplies or the mannequin didn't work right. Okay. It's the same thing with real patients. You're not always going to find a really good pulse on a patient. You, can all, you cannot always blame the mannequin, right? So we have to consider those type things. Okay, Amy, we're a transport team. Ah, excellent. So we get a pre-brief of the patient situation and bring your equipment with us depending upon their needs. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you for sharing. So it depends. You can do it any way you want to. Um, and you learn over time what you need to brief on and what you don't the more and more you run it. So thank you for sharing. Um, excellent. Okay. Next slide, Helen. So I think this is one um, that's pretty important when you're briefing and talking to learners is we try to provide a psychologically safe learning environment when students come in. And we want them to feel comfortable um, in the simulation and comfortable in the debriefing. And even though that there may be some things that pop up in the sim that happen, you know, maybe the wrong armband is on. We're not out there to trick them. We're trying to give them a replica of what may happen in the real environment. Um, we want to make sure that we adhere to the simulations code of ethics, or we want to be transparent as much as we can. You know, I don't often tell them, I tell them the objectives, but I may not be telling them the case that day. This might be where they're learning about what, if it's a mock code, it might be they know it's going to be a code, right? And they're going to a code but they may not know the patient and what's going on with that patient. Um, I think in pre-briefing, we can answer questions as much as we can. We want to support them in that environment. Um, and I think people learn from actions and our learners and our staff will learn from your actions. So if you've done a simulation and you've done a really good pre-brief, the simulation you, you did that worked out well and in debriefing, you're supporting that our goal in simulation is excellent patient care and patient safety. That's ultimately what we're doing. I'm not here to judge anyone in the room. Although we have judgment, we might be curious, why, does John, why is John struggling with that today? So getting curious about that and how do we help people get better? And that's what we're doing. So trying to provide that um, environment. And as we get to debriefing, which I think we'll be hoping in the next few versions, is how do we not get defensive? You have a nurse residency program, or maybe you've run six mock codes that week, and still this time, they, can't, they forget the backboard. You know, you can get frustrated, and you can just get defensive as a simulationist or a debriefer, like, why did that come up? We are, we always talk about the backboard, you know. How do you handle that, and how do you really get curious with your learners, and how do you set them up for success in pre-briefing? That if you've seen this consistent problem that's putting the backboard under, okay, we're missing the boat somewhere. How do we go back and reinforce that behavior within that? And you learn a lot as you go through these and maybe what you need to brief on to remind people as they're going through this. Um, another space is not just psychological safety, but physical safety. And often in our pre-briefing, we often will say, hey, if you end up getting sick or you feel like you're going to pass out or you're pregnant, you're about to have your baby, um, you are to raise your hand and say, stop. This is not a simulation. I need assistance. Okay. Um, it's very important. And I'll tell you one reason why. Sometimes we have where maybe a staff member is embedded that actually does pass out during a code. Okay. Depends on what you're doing. At IMSH, several years ago, I don't know if John or Helen were there. And some of you may have been there. We had a speaker, one of our keynotes that got up to speak to a large, large crowd of people at IMSH. And he all of a sudden grabbed his chest was having chest pain. And the simulation people look, oh, that man, it's gonna be a simulation. Great, this is gonna be good. I can't believe we're having a simulation first day. It was not a simulation. It was a true event. And that really made people really take note of, there has to be a way in the world of sim that we stop and say, this is not a simulation, I need help. So I say that because it ended up the guy ended up having a heart attack. I don't exactly know. I think he ended up being okay. But the rest of us thinking this is a sim, oh, we were like blowing it off as a simulation. So I think it's important that you have a safety phrase. And Helen, you popped on. Do you want to say something? 
or you're just popping back? No, I was just popping back in. Okay, you can just pop <laughs> back in. Um, okay. But it's important that you also include that safety for people. Also in pre-briefing, let's say you guys, if anyone does death and dying, I know at our children's hospital, they do a lot of death and dying simulation, is the students need to be prepared before they come. Whether it's a fetal demise or a child that's dying, um, people may have been in some situations that's gonna cause a lot of um, anxiety. Um, it's gonna bring back a lot of emotion. In some learners, I've been in many debriefings where people were very tearful. And I've asked, do you want to leave? And they're like, no, I'm okay. This is good for me. You know, maybe they lost a child a few months ago. Okay. Or their kid has been really, really sick in the hospital a few months ago and they were near death door. And it's just brought a lot of things back to them. You need to be prepared for that. And so hopefully in briefing or in your preparation that they're aware that, hey, we are going to be talking about some very sensitive, difficult topics related to death and dying. The people need to be prepared, but we also have to be prepared for this might happen, and how are we as a simulation team going to handle it um, at that time? Do we let them step out? Do we send someone with them, let them cry? There's all different things, and you guys just have to have something prepared, but that's been part of your pre-briefing and briefing for making it psychologically safe um, as well. So, Next slide, please. Or is that towards the end? That actually brings us to the questions. Oh, good. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. I've been asking quite a bit as we um, have gone along. I've gotten some really good things. That's yeah, I actually thought it would be really cool if maybe an audience member shares um, a difficult scenario that you have that you might need some oh, guidance yeah. or advice on. I think it'd be really cool. Not just one person, a few people can drop in a sure. couple of scenarios that you have. It's like phone a friend. I'm going to have to phone a friend if I don't have an answer. Yeah. That oh, no, it's phone fine. Phone a friend. I can tell you um, as we're waiting for that to come in. Um, just on a patient side, I recently, um, four months ago, or actually five months ago, um, gave birth to a beautiful girl, baby girl. And then three days after I gave birth, I was sent back to the hospital with preeclampsia, severe Oh, pain. no, that's not it, good. It's awful. I'm laughing now, but there's pain under there. It was awful, horrible experience. Um, but I, coming from, like, the education and, like, this world, I was able to really understand why my doctors and the entire staff was being super careful and they were going through all of these different steps and checklists with me and making sure that I understood what was going on. I understood the process of what was going to happen. I understood the symptoms of what I was going to be feeling. And of course, you know, the outcome, right? They wanted to make sure that I was clear on the outcome and, and, um, and knew that everything was preventative. So it was a very painful process, but I saw my team of healthcare professionals working really, really hard. And I was thinking back to the standards of best practice and how they were, in my opinion, going through that and, and following through with their education to make sure that I was safe as a patient. So I was, I was fine. I'm okay. Um, but it was scary, a very scary situation. That is scary. And I don't do OB, so I'm staying out of it. Yeah. Um, so we do have some questions. So Deborah, thank you for the questions. I appreciate it. So can you clarify briefing versus pre-briefing? That is the age old question. And I'll try to summarize, but if you look in the standard, I knew it was in here, but I wanted to clarify. If you go to a page 10, actually it talks about the language. And as you know, we have our healthcare simulation dictionary. And the simulation world, we're getting better with our language and our terminology, but we're not quite there yet. And it's actually discussed in here, um, examples of different terms include things like pre-scenario learning activities, pre-planning sessions, briefing, pre-briefing, briefing, pre-simulation briefing, pre-simulation pre assignments, there's all kinds of terms. Um, so I think their purpose in this standard was that, you know, pre-briefing is sort of the overall term and there can be two phases to it, preparing prior to coming as well as briefing them, whether before or on the day. So I don't know that we're quite there, Deborah. So I think you can use them interchangeably because I still call it a pre-brief, although I probably need to be using the term briefing, but I think people still use it interchangeably. Not sure if that answers your question, um, but it's very confusing for all of us. And the standard tried to guide us to some more standardized language, 
And the new standards, there's four standards that are getting revised that should come out next fall. I can't remember which ones they are. A whole new group is working on them. I'm anxious to see about the, um, the same thing. Yes, I validate with you that, however, in here it says, as a result, the standard and the term pre-briefing will be divided into two distinct components, preparation and briefing, and refer to those activities that occur prior to the simulation. So I still call it a pre-brief because it's old for me. I still call an embedded participant an ESP, embedded simulation participant. So um, thank you for asking because that is my thing. Um, so your other question was, do you recommend a standardized template for pre-briefing? And yes, I have an example or two that we use. It's, it's, I can't find the most current one, but I'll do my best that I can give it to Helen to send out. I try to include all of the important aspects, which to me are basic assumption, fiction contract. Um, and I teach a graduate class that they're required to look at these things. Um, confidentiality, are you being recorded? Um, any orientation for the mannequin, logistics, expectations. Um, I use a standardized kind of template, but I always adapt it to what I need, what I need for this simulation. So let me give you an example. So if I went through, hey, you guys are going to be caring for a critically ill patient in the emergency room, and I go through my basic assumption, confidentiality, all those type things, I might even say, so um, as you go to care for your patient in the ER, um, you know, just to let you know, the patient already has an IV. So there's no need to start an IV. The patient came in, they, that was already done for you. Um, that's just one little example. So I do try to adapt to, if I have grad students that are coming in to do um, managing three patients in the ER or in acute care, or you guys might have a multi-patient situation or mock code, you might want to tell them, you know, the new defibrillator will be used today or, you know, something specific. But I do try to use standardized to ensure that we're doing at least the minimum across everything. Whatever I want standardized, I firmly believe in having standardized templates with the ability to add and tweak as needed. I don't want to take away anything. Um, also about the safe word. And I don't believe in making up, I don't, it's my opinion, I don't believe in making up a world like Daffy Duck, you know. Um, most of us are using this is not a simulation, and we tell the students if something happens, you need to stop and say this is not a simulation, I need help, um, that type thing. Um, I hope that helps, Deborah. Um, I think preparation, there might be a lot of different things you do, quizzes, um, reading protocols, articles, um, you know, maybe they have to create a care plan for a simulated patient beforehand. We actually have a simulation where they're sent a video. This is a neonatal nurse practitioner student program. There's been a video before about coming to campus, being in SIM, yeah, yeah. They've already been in SIM before. This is their last semester, so it's a pretty big event. But they get to campus um, usually the day before, and we send them out their checkout list. So we send them their 12 babies or whatever they're taking care of. Now, mind you, we're not going to have 12 babies that they're caring for there. But they have to review the orders, what's happening with that baby. So when they walk in the next day, the nurse can give them a checkout or, or the, the provider can say, hey, so-and-so's here, so-and-so got discharged, you know, blah, 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 blah. So that's part of our preparation. But even before they get in on that first day, we remind them, don't forget you've been videotaped. I mean, it's more logical, right? Um, hey, welcome to simulation. We're glad you're here today. Um, I know you've gotten your patient checkout, but just a few reminders, yada, yada, yada. So, um, so that's how we handle that situation. Um, let's see. I think I struggle because I do sims on the floors. I know the process is sometimes, ah, excellent. I'm with you. Sometimes I do shorten it um, as we move along, but I do tend to just say, hey, don't forget confidentiality. We keep everything to ourselves. It's in the HIPAA world. Um, but I see it backfired on you because you did have a new nurse. So, and I do tell people, it's like being on a plane. And the little, I've been traveling a lot lately, a little safety person goes up. You're supposed to read your thing, and she goes through the same exact thing that we go through every time we're on a plane. It's that safety list. So I've heard it. I might phase out a little bit. Or I might hear if I haven't been on a plane in a while. So I think you bring up a good point, Deborah. I think it's important you, you know, bring it up again. Now, if you're doing Sims two days in a row, you may not want to do it that second day. You just say, hey, guys, we went through pre-briefing. Do you have anything else? You know, let me know. 
Um, I did go back to aviation for quite a bit, Deborah. So all their checklists and stuff. So thank you. So. These are good questions. I love it. Yeah, this is very good. Continue dropping them in the chat. Um, and we'll go through a couple more resources uh, for you all. But yeah, drop the questions in the chat. And we'll get them answered as we're going through this. So um, I don't know if everyone is aware of this, but this is actually a webinar series. And we've actually already done um, three different webinars. And then today will be the fourth. So we did a general webinar on the standards of best practice, going over all of the standards and just you know, touching on each one. And then we did an operations standard webinar where we focused on the criterion associated with that one. Um, a couple of months ago, we focused on a webinar um, highlighting the simulation design, which was great as well. Um, a very That one was a very engaging webinar, and we actually were able to pull in some AI and have AI generate scenarios on the spot, so that one was great. Um, and then this is obviously pre-briefing. So um, as we go through this, we want to encourage that we want to encourage you all to join these webinars because they're really insightful. We want to, you know, be able to um, share all of the information that we're learning and, and you guys be able to incorporate and in, incorporate it into what you're doing at your um, practice as well. And but we want to know what you guys are interested in hearing next. You know, we um, I think naturally debriefing might fall in line, but let us know what you're interested in learning about and we'll um, highlight that within the next couple couple of months. Um, and yeah, these recordings are all available. Actually, when I send out the link to this recording, I'm going to share the recording underneath the other um, recordings that we have as well. So you'll be able to see everything and share them with any of your colleagues or friends in the industry as well. So what, what are you guys interested in hearing about next? Just uh, let us know. Um, Another thing is, this is, I think someone asked about this, but maybe John dropped it in the chat. This is the link to the standards of best practice. So if you get a moment, you can um, scan this QR code. Um, but like I said, I'm pretty sure John dropped it in the chat. So I will move on to the next thing. But we do like to share a list of compiled resources. Um, there are different books that we recommend, and this comes from just the past couple of months of us doing this series, um, but here are a few books that we recommend. So grab a screenshot of this, and then a few conferences that we suggest as well. Obviously, we're going to talk about Anaxel, um, because that is a great uh, nursing conference that shares a ton of great information to different segments within the um, within the simulation world. And then Laridol, we actually have our own conference. It's coming up on October 28th through the 30th of, the, of this month. I'm sure, I think I saw a couple of people's names that are um, listed here who are going to be attending. If you haven't registered for that, I I definitely recommend registering if you have some extra room in your budget. Um, it's $700 and it starts on the 28th through the 30th of this month. So um, it's going to be awesome. It's in Las Vegas. I will drop a link to that as well. And then we have IMSH, which typically takes place in January. That's another great conference that's going to be coming up really soon. Um, and then we have the NLN, which was, I think, last week or two weeks ago. And then for operators and technicians, the Sim Ops and Sim Ghost conferences are both really awesome as well. All of these are great education resources that you can, um, you know, you can leverage in your day to day after attending these conferences. Uh, let's see. Let me make sure I'm getting to anything. So yeah, we'll get to. It looks like debriefing um, is might be the next one. So Dr. Watts, get ready for the debriefing. Okay, uh, that's going to be a long one, yeah. a lot to cover. We'll have to, I yeah. love it. Oh, yeah, we'll have fun. Um, and then here are some additional um, publications that we want to share with you. Um, and if you have anything that you want to add to this list, please drop it in the chat, because I'm sure that'll share other people as well. We'll add that to this. And um, there's some podcasts. Actually, Laredal has a podcast as well that I can share with you via email. But Sim, Sim Geeks is a really good podcast. Just a really yeah. interesting comment down there um, from Junior. I'd love to hear ideas on reporting ROI of simulations. Um, that's a really interesting thing, and I think that's probably one of those huge questions to ask, um, especially in a hospital, hospital um, for sure. So that's a great question. Great idea. Yeah. 
Awesome. Um, and here's just a little bit of information. Um, John's information is here. So if you have any specific questions about VA and um, or even questions about webinars or anything like that, you can always just reach out to him. Um, and then here is uh, some information on one of our really awesome products. It's called Nursing and Simulator. And it's this is the geriatric version. We have an entire um, family of uh, uh, Nursing and Simulator. So Feel free to scan and take a look at that if you are interested in learning more about that. But I think we have, um, it looks like Shelly asked a question, Penny, or Dr. Watts, excuse me. Oh, Lord, please. Oh, capture simulation workload. They got some really good questions in there, John. Um, I'll tell you what, what we do is we capture, and this is an academic setting, um, how much time is set up, takedown, meeting preparation. It's a lot. Of course, the first time you do anything, it's always more, um, but we're trying to capture that as well. There there are a couple of articles on that, not a lot, but they're more in academic setting. So I'm really curious about hospital setting. And John, you may have some things to add since you do a lot of hospital stuff on workload. Excellent question. Yep. Lots of webinars we need to, to do. Yeah, this is great. John, are you, um, I hope you're taking notes of some of the uh questions and comments in here so we can incorporate that for the next webinar. Absolutely. Uh, awesome. And you have another question here from um, yeah. Shelly. So Shelly, you're talking about developing scenarios and simulation experiences for those in the VA. Ah. Uh, Okay, and you had an answer from Deborah. I know Laredal has scenarios. Um, my faculty tend to want to recreate the will a lot of times. And I think that's a problem because then you have to validate for content. Um, everything has to be validated. And a lot of the pre-done ones have already been um, gone through that process. I know John knows more about those than I do, but it's a good question. That is. And we, we do offer... Uh scenario cloud so we we have scenarios available that you all can purchase um that are pre-scripted and vetted and validated so feel free to reach out directly to myself or anyone on our sales team will be able to help with that john just over your years have you seen any other uh, va specific resources that are um available just out there um, nothing that I know of right off the top of my head. I know SimLearn uh, is directly involved in that as well, but I don't know if they have a, a set of scenarios that they've already created that I'm not sure of. Um, I know there's a lot of free scenarios out there. Um, it just like the NLN has a bunch of them, um, different cases, but you, know, you still have to, you know, ensure the validity of them. Is it accurate information? Is the lab work accurate? We still have sim simulation scenarios, John. I need to see about buying some more from years ago that were on paper in the little binder um, that we had pulled from. But I agree. It is very intensive to recreate a scenario with, you know, um, the right vital signs and the right lab work and the right history and the background and the case information, um, it can be daunting. So, but it looks like Deborah and Shelly are going to connect. So that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. New friends. Yes. Just, just as a thought, when you're, when you're looking at creating your own scenarios, when you start looking at the validation time and all of the man hours that you spend both validating and creating, <clears throat> if you look at your cost per hour, it quickly becomes financially what? possible. <laughs> Something that you really don't want to do. Um, not when you can buy them off the shelf already validated for such a low price. Um, right. it, it just isn't cost effective anymore to create your own. And I did want to say, so I'm going to send um, Helen, there's an article that you can pull off. I'm sending it to her. I don't know the legalities of that, but they can't access that, but um, uh, an excellent article as well as a couple of our previous pre-briefing checklists that we've used. They're 
Some of them are not all encompassing, some are, um, but it might give you an idea. There's even one that's a narrative. So if someone had to do it as they walked in off the street, which I don't recommend, I think who pre-briefs should debrief, that's my opinion. But it is at least there if Helen had to walk in and pre-brief because I got caught up somewhere. Um, but I do have a checklist. So if that helps you at all, yeah. um, feel free to use. And, you know, I won't say they're perfect because I just quickly pulled them out of my file. So they may be a few years old. So. Actually, would you like to share your, um, would you like to share that, the one PDF you were showing me, the study earlier? Oh, yeah, do you still have that pulled up? Yeah, I did. Okay. The one with like the pre-briefing element? Yeah, the, I think that was, yeah. that was a great resource. Okay. I will pull that up right now. So this is an article. Can you see it okay, Helen? Yes. Yep, we can see it. So this, I'm going to go up to the top. This is the name of the article that was published a few years ago. So I know there may be a few things that need to be updated. But I like visual. I like graphs and so forth. And um, it was in 2019. So some of the language may have changed. But this is a really interesting, it may have shifted a little bit, pre-briefing element. Now, mind you, the standard was written in 2021, so that pre-briefing, briefing preparation is not in here necessarily. Um, but I do like the fact that you're setting the scene. If you look here, expectations of the facilitator and the participant, the purpose, the method, the process of debriefing that you're going to go through, um, all those types of things that you're looking at that you have to consider in pre-briefing. Um, and they actually give you some... Um, words to use. You're going to have so many minutes in simulation. We're going to hold confidentiality throughout the simulation. So this might really be helpful. Um, you know, if you guys need something, um, I just, I like this article and I wish they would do it again and maybe update a little bit because it's good to me. I like these. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's definitely share that. I think that's going to be a great resource for people to reference as well. Well, that brings us to the end of the webinar. You guys were an awesome, awesome, yeah, awesome audience. You guys had a lot of great questions for us, and I really hope you were able to take some nuggets away and, you know, be able to include that in your pre-briefing starting now. So um, do you have any last words, Dr. Watts? I don't. I think you will never be perfect in what you do, ever. Um, you just learn after each simulation to tweak it, to do, you know, what's best for your learners. And you know, it's never perfect. So don't beat yourself up, but doing better, trying each time to set them up for success is going to help your whole experience. So, and thank y'all for joining us today. Absolutely. Yes. And be on the lookout for our debriefing webinar information. We'll probably get that out in the next uh, month or so. So be on the lookout for that. And I will send an email. I'm not going to say it's going to come out today because we have a lot of things to add to it, but I'll send the recording tomorrow to all of you. Um, but thank you all for joining and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you, Take everyone. Care. Thank you, Dr. Watts. Oh, thank, thank you. you.